Autumn Carol Wallace was born on January 15, 1981. In 1990, nine-year-old Autumn was living with her mom and sister in Anaheim, California, and was in the third grade at Salk Elementary School. Friends and family described her as having a contagious smile and a love for life. In 1990, Autumn's sister, 18-year-old April Wallace, with the approval from their mother, Linda, allowed 18-year-old Maria Del Rosio Afara, who went by Rosie, and her son to move into the home after they had nowhere else to go. Unfortunately, this was the biggest mistake of their lives. By the age of 13, Rosie was already addicted to drugs and had turned to prostitution by the age of 14. By 15, she had her first of four children. After moving into the Wallace home, Rosie continued using drugs, hanging out with her druggy friends, and would stay out all hours of the night. This left the Wallace family to take care of her son. Linda didn't want this in her house and decided Rosie needed to go. After leaving, Rosie moved into a house full of her druggy friends. Sadly, her need for drugs would lead her to destroy the most precious part of the Wallace family. On June 15, 1990, Autumn was home by herself, waiting for April and Linda to return from work. At the same time, Rosie and her two male friends were looking for a way to get drugs, so she decided to rob the Wallace house. When she arrived at their home and knocked on the door, Autumn answered. Autumn was very familiar with Maria, but not in a bad way. She was too young to understand why the family had kicked her out. And since she was home alone, she was most likely happy to have someone there she knew. Once inside, Rosie told Autumn she was going to the bathroom to fix her hair. A few minutes later, she asked Autumn to come in there as well. Unbeknownst to Autumn, Rosie had stolen a knife from the kitchen. When Autumn entered, she asked her to wash some eyelash curlers for her. She agreed, and after turning around, Rosie began stabbing her, not stopping until she had stabbed her a total of 50 times. She then went from room to room, stealing anything she thought might be of value. In the end, she stole a portable television, a VCR, a typewriter, a telephone, and a Nintendo, which only got her $240. It's theorized that the overkill was due to the Wallace family having such a loving home and a good life, and Rosie was mad because she was throwing her life away. When Linda returned home later that day, she sadly found Autumn dead on the bathroom floor. That evening, while investigators were at the home, Rosie casually showed back up, asking if she could speak with April. She was denied that opportunity, but the officer she spoke to found the encounter strange and mentioned it to investigators. It remains unclear why she came by, but sometimes killers do that because they are curious about what's going on, or they are proud of what they did. It could also be both of these things. Inside the home, investigators found a bloody shoe print, and when they searched the home Rosie was staying at, they found the matching shoes. She was then arrested and charged with Autumn's murder. During a police-taped interview, Rosie confessed to the crime, saying she was high on drugs at the time. She later tried to recant her confession, saying that an unidentified man had forced her to stab Autumn. She then changed her story once again and said that one of the two males who drove her to the Wallace home had entered with her and forced her to kill Autumn. However, she refused to identify that man. Investigators never found forensic evidence to prove anyone but Rosie and the Wallace family were in the house that day. At the time of the murder, Rosie was pregnant with twins, which were her third and fourth child. In 1992, she was convicted of first-degree murder. However, the jury deadlocked on the death sentence with two out of the 12 jurors holding out. This led to a mistrial and a new jury was brought in. This time, all members of the jury sentenced her to death. At the time of her sentencing, she was only the third woman on death row in California. In August of 2007, her death sentence was upheld by the California Supreme Court. As of 2024, Rosie remains on death row, and it's unclear when she will be executed. Cheryl Lynn Huss was born on July 28, 1954, in California and went by Sherry. In 1994, 39-year-old Sherry was living in an apartment on Parma Drive in Desert Hot Springs, California, and was a recently divorced mother of three. 
At the time, she was making plans to buy a small home out in the desert where she could raise her kids. Unfortunately, she would never get the chance. On Saturday, April 23, 1994, Sherry called her parents and left them a distraught message. Her mother, Ruth Friedman, said that Sherry sounded terrified and desperate and explained that someone had been calling her phone repeatedly and then hanging up with her. She also said that someone had been taking photos of her. When her parents finally heard the message, they left San Fernando Valley, arriving at 9 the following morning. After parking, Ruth said she knew immediately something was wrong when she saw Sherry's white Plymouth was parked on the street instead of the driveway. The porch light was on and the family dog was out. When they walked up to the apartment door, they found it unlocked. Upon entering, they would sadly find Sherry lying on the floor, stabbed to death. Thankfully, her three children were with their father that night. When investigators arrived, they noticed that Cheryl had bite marks on her body, along with saliva around the marks. That, along with blood evidence, was collected and preserved. Using the saliva, they were able to generate a DNA profile and upload it to CODIS, but there were no matches. The case would then go unsolved for the next 30 years. In February 2022, the Riverside County Regional Cold Case Team used forensic genetic genealogy and was able to identify a person of interest by the name of Sharon Eugene Gavlin. They then learned that at the time of the murder, he was living around 12 miles away in Thousand Palms. Investigators then obtained a warrant to collect his saliva and were able to confirm the DNA match. On March 4, 2022, he was arrested during a traffic stop in Gardena, California, two hours away from where he murdered Sherry. He was then charged with first-degree murder, but pleaded not guilty. Gadlin has multiple convictions on his record, including breaking and entering, public intoxication, disorderly conduct, and drug charges. Gadlin, who is now 50 years old, would have been around 20 years old at the time of the murder. At this time, a motive has not been released to the public. Livy Heather Lewis was born on October 4, 2001, in Shreveport, Louisiana, to Darcy and Jeremy, and went by Liv. In 2020, 19-year-old Liv was living in Hemp Hill, Texas, and working as a CNA. Friends and family described her as a kind and independent individual who wasn't afraid of anything. On October 30th, 2020, she attended a Halloween party at the home of Bobby Ozon with her boyfriend, Matthew Edgar. Bobby and Matthew were friends and had been hanging out together all day. Also at the party was Montana Bockel, who was previously married to Matthew and had two kids with him. The two children were also in attendance at the party. Matthew and Montana had married in March of 2019, but divorced in June of 2020 after he began seeing Liv. Even though Liv was the reason they divorced, she and Montana ended up being good friends. At some point during the night, Matthew got upset and left. When he returned, he and Liv began screaming at each other. He was allegedly upset that she had been talking to another guy at the party. By 1 a.m. in the morning, Bobby was tired and went to his room. At some point, Liv went into Bobby's room to try and convince him to come out and drink more. Montana also went into the room, and the three of them began talking about leaving and riding around together, but Bobby declined. Liv then decided she was just going to stay the night at his house. I assume that is because of the argument she had with Matthew earlier. Montana decided to go home and, on her way out, encountered an extremely intoxicated Matthew at the back door. I'm assuming she told him about Liv's plans to stay the night, which only fueled an already upset Matthew. He immediately blamed Montana for Liv wanting to stay and began physically assaulting her. Once she was able to retreat back inside, she asked Bobby to help. Bobby then rushed outside and found Matthew kicking Montana's car. He then restrained him while the girls got into their cars and left but Matthew quickly jumped in his own vehicle, which had both children in it, and began following them. I assume he was getting ready to go home, which is why the children were already in his vehicle. All three began driving down Highway 83. Montana would later say that he kept running into the back of her car while they were driving down the road. 
She eventually ended up at 278 Old Hogan Place, while Liv continued on turning around at Dan Prado Drive. From my research, I found that Matthew and his mother, Sandy, lived at this address, as did the Hogan family. After Montana arrived at the Hogan family home on Highway 83, she received a text from Matthew that said, You're like Liv, you are trapped at my house. At 3.05 a.m., he sends another text that says, Neither of y'all can get past here. Montana then asks if she can come down there, to which he replies, No, you will die. She then tries to tell him she hasn't done anything, but Matthew sends another text that says, You knew when I pulled up, y'all knew I would watch y'all die with a smile on my face. They continue to text until 3.34 a.m. when Montana asks Matthew where Liv is, to which he replies, Dead. When Liv turned around at Dan Prado Drive and headed back down Highway 83, she apparently stopped and decided to talk to Matthew. This was the biggest mistake of her life. Matthew began beating her before finally shooting her at close range with a shotgun. I also want to note that at some point, Matthew took Zach Hogan's truck. I'm just not sure if it was before or after he murdered Liv. My theory is that Matthew took whatever vehicle he was driving with the kids to the Hogan residence where his mother Cindy and Montana were. I believe he then jumped in Zach's vehicle and continued looking for Liv. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found Liv dead, hunched over her steering wheel. Authorities didn't have to look far for this piece of shit. He actually remained on the scene, covered in Liv's blood, in a fetal position on the ground behind her car. He was then taken to the emergency room in an ambulance. While on the way, he told the escorting officer that the last thing he remembered was drinking on a porch. After being treated, he was arrested and charged with her murder. Strangely, when officers began investigating the scene, they didn't find Liv's keys in the car. Instead, Matthew's mother, Cindy, had them. Also interesting is that the Hogan family home burned down a week after authorities searched it. Montana would say that Cindy wouldn't let her leave the house. Also, at no point did anyone in either family call 911. Liv was murdered before 4 a.m., and it wasn't reported until closer to 5 a.m. when a woman named Lily Hudson happened upon the scene. She went up to Liv's car and found her hunched over the steering wheel. As she was walking around the car, she tripped over a body behind it, which was Matthew. At first, thinking Liv was asleep or drunk, she checked her pulse and called 911. She would later say that she felt like someone was watching her, and since the incident, she had endured harassment. As for Matthew, this was not his first run-in with the law. In 2015, he was convicted of evading arrest and detention, causing serious bodily injury, and was sentenced to three years of confinement and three years of probation. In 2021, while waiting for trial, he was arrested for the assault of a family member. His trial started on January 24, 2022. Shockingly, three days into the trial on January 26, Matthew went on the run and was placed on the Texas Most Wanted list. The trial then continued without him, and he was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to 99 years in prison. Almost a year later, on December 29, 2022, U.S. Marshals, along with members from the Texas Parks and Wildlife, located Matthew near Hemp Hill, Texas. They found him sitting on the back porch of a house not far from his mother's home, smoking a cigarette. In October of 2023, Matthew's mother, Cindy, was indicted on charges of hindering apprehension or prosecution of a known felon. I haven't found any further details on her, but I do know she bonded out the same day and is most likely awaiting trial. Thankfully, Matthew will now spend the rest of his life behind bars and can never hurt another innocent person. Christy Ellen Bryant was born in San Antonio, Texas on August 6, 1951. Friends and family described her as a very helpful and friendly individual. In 1971, 19-year-old Christy moved to California while serving in the United States Marine Corps. However, in 1972, Christy was medically discharged from the Marines after being injured in a car accident. 
In 1974, 22-year-old Christy was living in San Diego and working at a 7-Eleven in National City. On July 31st, 1974, Christy was working alone at the convenience store when someone came in around 3 a.m. and brutally stabbed her to death. While DNA wasn't available at the time, police still collected and preserved blood found at the crime scene that belonged to the suspect. He most likely had injured himself while stabbing her a total of 37 times. In 2008, that DNA was entered into CODIS, but there were no matches. In 2012, National City detectives requested the lab perform a familial DNA search, but there were no matches. They searched again in 2015 and 2016, but once again, nothing. So they turned to forensic genetic genealogy, and they were able to provide investigators with a potential lead. From that, investigators determined that Carlin Edward Cornett, now in his late 60s, was responsible for Christie's murder. On September 14, 2021, Carlin was arrested and charged with her murder at his home in Las Vegas, Nevada. In June of 2023, he was sentenced to five years to life in prison. Unfortunately, he didn't receive the current 15 years to life because in 1974, second-degree murder charges were only for five years to life. On September 19, 1987, 20-year-old David Knobling, a married man with a baby on the way, and 14-year-old Robin Edwards were spending time with David's younger brother and cousin. Later that evening, Robin snuck out of her home to meet up with David, and neither would make it back alive. The following day, David's pickup truck was found abandoned in a parking lot at the Ragged Island Wildlife Management and Refuge area. The engine was still running, the radio playing, and the windshield wipers were on, but no one was inside. Investigators did, however, find the couple's clothes neatly folded into a pile. Three days later, a jogger found Robin and David's bodies on the bank of James River. They were both partially clothed and had been shot to death. Around this time, between 1986 and 1989, three other couples were murdered along a 23-mile stretch known as the Colonial Parkway. This stretch of roads links Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown, Virginia. The murders began on October 9, 1986, with the murder of former U.S. Naval Academy graduate 27-year-old Kathy Thomas and 21-year-old Rebecca Dowski. The women were found dead inside Kathy's 1980 Honda Civic after it had been pushed down an embankment off a Colonial Parkway pullout outside Williamsburg. The killer tried to set the car on fire by using diesel but was unsuccessful. Both victims were strangled and had their throats viciously slashed. David and Robin's deaths occurred a year later. Seven months later, two young students, 20-year-old Richard Call, known by his middle name Keith, and 18-year-old Cassandra Haley, who went by Sandy, were both students at Christopher Newport College in Newport News, Virginia. On April 9, 1988, they went on a date to the movies and attended a party afterward. After leaving the party, they were never seen alive again. The following day, Keith's Toyota Celica was found parked at one of the Parkway's scenic overlooks. The keys were still inside, along with a watch, eyeglasses, and both Keith and Cassandra's clothes. However, they were nowhere to be found. Tracker dogs tracked their scent down a steep embankment to a small beach. Divers spent hours searching underwater, but found no signs that Keith or Sandy had been on the beach. To this day, their bodies have never been found. On July 11, 1989, 29-year-old Teresa Lynn Spall Howell, who went by Terry, was last seen outside the Zodiac Club in Hampton, Virginia, near the Colonial Parkway. Later that day, her body was found by construction workers near their work site on Butler Farm Road. The last couple to be murdered was 18-year-old Anna Maria Phelps and her boyfriend's older brother, 21-year-old Daniel Lauer. They, along with Anna Maria's boyfriend, shared a Virginia Beach home. In September 1989, Daniel had returned to town to pack up some more clothes, and Anna Marie rode along so she could visit some of her family. After leaving to head back to Virginia Beach, they were never seen alive again. 
The next day, Daniel Chevy Nova was located abandoned at the New Kent rest stop on I-64, which is in the opposite direction from where they were headed. Six weeks later, turkey hunters found their remains over a mile from Daniel's car. Unfortunately, with little to no leads, these cases would go unsolved. That is until a man named Alan Wade Wilmer Sr. was discovered deceased in his home on December 15, 2017. A delivery driver had spotted his door open and entered to find him dead. Due to the state of his remains, they had to rely on DNA to make sure he really was Alan Wilmer. 63-year-old Alan's ultimate cause of death was from hardening of the arteries. At the time, they had no idea how crucial his DNA would be. Alan, who sometimes went by Pokey, was a fisherman with a custom-built wood boat called Denny Wade. He also owned several vehicles, including a distinctive-looking 1966 Dodge Fargo pickup with the license plate EMRAW on the front, which investigators believe stood for Edom Raw. This is most likely a reference to the shellfishing, mainly clams and oysters, that Allen would do. At the time of his death, he was divorced and living alone but had two adult children from his previous marriage. He also had no felony convictions on his record. When investigators began going back through the murder cases, they realized they had DNA from Allen, who was a suspect at one time in the disappearance of Keith and Cassandra. Detectives at the time were certain he was their suspect, but let him go after he passed a polygraph exam. The FBI had even profiled the killer as being a local fisherman, and Kathy and Rebecca were strangled with a fishing cord. When they finally ran his DNA in June of 2023, it linked to the murders of David, Robin, and Terry, officially solving their cases after 30-plus years. Unfortunately, at this time, he has not been forensically linked to the murders of the other six people, but the FBI is continuing their investigation. He definitely seems like the likely suspect in all the murders, but only time will tell if they can find the evidence to prove it.